Today, the federal government is charging Eric Robert Rudolph with the bombings of the 1996 Summer Olympic Games, the Sandy Springs Professional Building, and the other side lounge. If I had to use one word to describe him, it would be a coward. Eric Robert Rudolph is still considered to be armed and dangerous. He has a specialized knowledge that we think makes him especially dangerous in the heavily wooded areas in which we are looking. These guys, they'd be better off just going home and living their lives, quit looking for them, because they're not going to find them. To these people, he's a god. As Eric's mother, I would like to say that he was more than a mugshot. The millennium dawned in mystery for the people who live in this rural Appalachian community. A small army of FBI agents searched homes, barns, and the mountains that surrounded them. The heavily armed force was on a manhunt. The target was Eric Robert Rudolph, a local man who was wanted in connection with several deadly bombings in the South. Despite the efforts of this highly trained force, Rudolph, perhaps with help from his Appalachian neighbors, managed to vanish into the mountains. The FBI vowed to capture Rudolph, and the manhunt continued. In the early morning of January 29, 1998, a pipe bomb detonated in front of a Birmingham abortion clinic, killing an off-duty police officer and maiming a nurse. It was the latest deadly skirmish in America's 30 years civil war over abortion. It was also the first death caused by a clinic bombing. Fire trucks were coming from this direction with police cars. It was coming from that direction. And this direction down here, they was coming from all directions. People started saying that it had been a bomb that exploded at the clinic down here. And I was in front of the clinic on one side of the street, and I could see where the bomb and exploded the windows out, and it was real bad that morning. Car's alarm was going off, windows was broke all around, it was a very large bomb. The blasts and shockwaves through Birmingham. Police, fire, and emergency response teams flooded the area. Smoke and sirens filled the air. And as people in this deeply religious southern city showed up for work and school, they found themselves in the newest battlefield of the war against abortion. People weren't happy once they heard somebody had been killed, and they weren't happy that someone had been hurt. But, um, but I think that a lot of the, the people think that it's OK to stop the action. It's OK to, to use violence to stop the abortions. I think it shook up a lot of different elements of this town, not the least of which is the anti-abortion movement had to step back and take a breath and try to determine if they in some way played a part. When I arrived at the scene, it was one of the worst things that I've had to cover. You could see the front of the building completely shattered. And you could tell this tragedy had happened there. And all of these little pink strings showed exactly how the damage had been inflicted. It's somewhat uh, analogous to me of the, uh, the date that uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. You'll, you always remember what happened that day. Workers at the abortion clinic already lived with fear. A federal restraining order kept anti-abortion protesters across the street, and Birmingham police officer Robert Sanderson was hired as a security guard to protect the clinic. The bomb killed him instantly. Officer Sanderson was in the middle of the sidewalk uh, when uh, when he was hit, the blast blew him back, and Nurse Lyons had just walked up, was uh, right about the, to the door. I was standing about 12 feet from the bomb when it went off, and it was a pipe bomb, and it had one and a half inch nails in it. So all the nails went into the building and into my body. Uh, it killed Officer Sanderson. Uh, it did a fair amount of uh, building damage. 
broke my legs, um, damaged my eye, destroyed my left eye, uh, first, second, and third degree burns over the front of my body. Um, just tore the skin off my legs, holes in my abdomen, cuts everywhere, hundreds of cuts all over my face. The FBI has told us it was detonated by remote control, which meant that whomever set that bomb sat there and waited to make sure that bodies, people, were in range. In three decades of struggle over legalized abortion, violence has claimed seven lives. Buffalo, New York, 1998, a sniper assassinated a doctor with one shot from a rifle. Pensacola, Florida, 1994, an assassin murdered a doctor in front of a clinic. Both acts were prompted by extremist religious belief. Thus, the defense of abortion rights became a high priority for the Clinton administration. Whoever committed the acts might kill again and must be brought to justice. And we will not rest until that happens. Federal agents sifted through the rubble of the bombed abortion clinic, looking for clues. We need some cooperation from the media. We will try to keep you updated as much as possible, knowing that we cannot talk about facts. We cannot talk about potential suspects. The Justice Department did have a suspect. A man disguised in a blonde wig was spotted by several witnesses leaving the scene in a gray Nissan pickup truck. He was followed by a suspicious witness who noted the license plate number. The number was traced to Eric Rudolph, and a massive manhunt was soon underway. Reporter Tiffany Taylor covered the explosion for Birmingham's local ABC station. The local police here in Birmingham had three witnesses. No one could say for a fact that Eric Robert Rudolph was on the scene that day. What they could say, however, one witness said he saw a man walking away from the clinic as it exploded and the man didn't look back and that seemed suspicious to him. A second witness said she was driving in the area and a man on foot was running away from the area and ran into her car mirror and she thought that was suspicious. We have issued the warrant for a Mr. Eric Robert Rudolph, white male, age 31. January 30th, 1998, uh, he made a purchase in a local store, uh, drove his truck uh, several hundred yards from his trailer where he was uh, the, a recent residence, and at that point uh, uh, disappeared. Local hunters found his pickup truck at the foot of a mountain. The feds said Rudolph had disappeared into the Nantahala Forest of Western North Carolina, where he grew up. The agents plunged into the wilderness after him. We're currently using every means available, including air support, electronic, uh, canine, and sophisticated evidence recovery techniques to assist us in this 24-hour-a-day search. They were searching 150 square miles of remote wilderness with everything they had. The bombing in Birmingham had shaken the country and Rudolph had to be found. We will be here until we develop credible evidence that he is no longer here or we arrest him. The bomb is the weapon of choice of cowards. Those who fear facing their victims prefer to remain in the shadows and only come out of the dark to deploy their bombs. While the FBI was conducting one of the largest manhunts in history, the Justice Department prepared a case against a man they knew very little about. The feds were reluctant to publicly discuss evidence and would only say that witnesses placed him at the scene and forensic lab results implicated Rudolph. The agencies involved never did release much official information about what evidence they have linking Eric Rudolph to the Birmingham clinic bombing, however. Through our investigation, we learned a couple of different things about what they were focusing on. Our sources told us that there was a shovel found in the back of the truck, that they had tested the dirt on the shovel and that it matched the dirt in front of the clinic. It wasn't long before federal authorities linked Rudolph to a string of attacks in Atlanta, including the Centennial Park bombing during the Olympics in 1996, an abortion clinic bombing in the Sandy Springs Professional Building, and yet another bomb at a lesbian bar in Atlanta.
but you'll see the, uh, the commonality in the letters of God. There's a common target with respect to the clinic. We're not prepared to go into those details except to say uh, he's wanted uh, for questioning with respect to the Atlanta bombings. The uh, letter taking responsibility for the Birmingham bomb was postmarked in Birmingham, sent to uh, Reuters in Atlanta, which is where the uh, letter claiming responsibility for the two Atlanta bombings was also sent. Investigators in Atlanta almost immediately when the connection was made between the Birmingham bombing and the Atlanta bombings, investigators in Atlanta were pretty forthright about the nails matching in the bombs in Birmingham and Atlanta. I have approved a reward of up to one million dollars for information leading to the arrest of Eric Rudolph. When the Justice Department took the unprecedented step of putting up a $1 million reward for Eric Rudolph, he became one of the most wanted men in the world. Every detail of Eric's face, every image available to the FBI was immediately transmitted to the country. But even the powerful forces of the FBI were soon to be tested by the clever fugitive hiding somewhere in the mountains. The FBI set up a command center in Andrews, North Carolina, and sent 200 task force agents from the FBI, ATF, and state agencies into the mountains searching for the elusive Eric Rudolph. They were equipped with flak jackets and automatic weapons and supported by airplanes and helicopters with infrared heat sensing monitors and electronic eavesdropping devices to pick up his trail. But he grew up in these hills, and locals, many openly rooting for Rudolph, had turned a cold shoulder to the army of federal agents. I grew up in Georgia, and I've known that there's a different mindset in Appalachia, and the FBI going into any part of Appalachia, whether it be North Georgia, East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, is not going to get any assistance from these folks. They don't trust the FBI. They don't trust anything having to do with the federal government. They got him tried, convicted, and everything, and they don't know for sure he'd done it or not. I think they're trying to find a scapegoat for the Atlanta bombing. It's easy to set somebody up or plant something on somebody. We're safe as long as he's out there. You turn him in, his, you know, you got to fear for your life because he's got friends. I wouldn't turn him in. Uh, I mean, I'll put it too straight. I wouldn't turn him in. I would uh, feed him. You know, I would give him clothes, I'd give him anything he wants. I think if he were to come out, he'd get shot on the spot. If they catch him, it would be by him making a mistake. The million dollar reward for Eric Rudolph may not have convinced North Carolina natives to give him up, but bounty hunters showed up for the million. And then came former Green Beret Colonel James Bo Greitz, leading a group of volunteers. I think he's very troubled emotionally and spiritually and physically. And I think maybe his tanks are just about dry, and it's time for him to come in and get refueled. We're here for him. Greit said he was there to bring Rudolph out of hiding and provide safe passage for his surrender. Others speculated that Bo was there because of the television coverage and to promote his radio talk show. After a week, Greitz gave up and went back west. According to reliable accounts, Eric Rudolph was last seen by a former neighbor and friend, George Nordman, who runs a health food store in Andrews. It was mid-July of 1998. Nordman says Rudolph claimed innocence and asked for hideout supplies. Nordman says he refused help, but admits that shortly after Rudolph showed up at his back door, a lot of durable supplies disappeared and $500 was left as payment. Nordman waited four days before reporting the incident. Beginning with his sighting in July, there were several events uh, of a particular nature between July and September, and then another of that same type on October the 23rd, and another of that same type uh, during the first two weeks of January that we feel are, are strongly indicative of his presence here. The FBI-led manhunt had chased Rudolph into the Nantahala forest and come up empty-handed. They had cut down the number of searchers to 30. Rudolph's sighting was a spur to get bigger, more aggressive. The number of official manhunters grew to over 200 men who were rotated in from all over the country every few weeks to keep the manpower supply fresh. When Rudolph's truck was discovered, it was the middle of winter. 
There were not a lot of leaves on the trees, and it was easier to see the terrain and what you were up against. By the time July came and they got their first real hint that he was in fact still alive and still in the area, suddenly it was the middle of summer. There were, there were bugs and there were snakes and there were leaves on the trees and it was a totally different terrain that they were now up against and it presented quite a few challenges for them. The government was sending its heavily armed agents into the woods in teams to sweep through dense wilderness that stretched over 150 square miles looking for one man. The forest was so thick that an FBI agent might have been five feet from Rudolph and never have known it. This is some of the most remote region ever. When you cross the top of the ridge at the Nantahala and head north, there's a streak of about 15 miles to the left on a ridge that a major road does not cross. There's no paved road to the top of that ridge. And when Rudolph was spotted in that part of North Carolina, I got down the relief map and said he won't be found in that region. I think there's no way he would have survived up there, especially through the winter, without the people helping him. Welcome to Back Talk 1070, Talk Radio 1070 WAPI. How are you, Dennis? I believe he had help lasting through the winter. Had to have. And I believe uh, he may have even had help leaving the area because if he had killed himself or even if a bear had a guy, that'd at least be bones. If it wasn't one of the searchers stumbled across him, took pity on him or sympathized with him on his anti-gay, anti-abortion stances and helped him out that way, I think it was people thinking that they were doing a good job for a, for a legend. For the FBI, Eric Rudolph was not a legend. He was a man on the run, a man they wanted. He's certainly an individual who can survive for long periods of, of time by himself in very rugged areas. He's an individual who is an accomplished hiker, backwoods person, uh, survivalist. How long did it take him to find the Unabomber? Let's see, it started in the mid-70s, no. didn't it? You bring up a good point, you know, when people talk about getting away with things, oh, you won't be able to get away with it long. Once again, you know, D.B. Cooper, the Unabomber who got away with it for a long, long time, and if he had never insisted on that manifesto being printed, mm -hmm. he would have continued to get away with it. Uh, his brother right, recognized his, brother, his handwriting. His, and, and recognized the phraseology yeah, and everything about it. Yeah, his style of writing it. his handwriting, but yeah. yeah. Bob's got a complaint. Hi, welcome to uh, Back Talk 1070. Bob. I just got, I just got one complaint. You all, all right. sound like you've already convicted a Rudolph. You said he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. So? He had not the trial. They can't even find him to try. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely I believe, right. I believe that if anybody kills somebody, they should be tried, convicted, and uh, hanged or whatever. But we got to catch him first. You yep. got to catch him first. For Patricia Rudolph, Eric's mother, the manhunt for her son became an endless nightmare. She was a virtual prisoner in her home in Florida, hiding from the media. She decided to write her own story about Eric, calling her work Man Most Wanted, A Mother's Perspective. Her account of Eric's life has never been told before. Coming up, Court TV's exclusive interview with Patricia Rudolph. She says that the FBI is chasing the wrong man and that Eric is the victim of a conspiracy. While Eric Rudolph continued to elude the FBI manhunted North Carolina, his mother Patricia was quietly, almost secretly, living on the coast of Florida. As a boy, Eric Rudolph loved the ocean. He spent most of his childhood near Miami Beach. Eric's mother tries to keep a low profile and feels she too is a prisoner of events. It has been a trying time for her. She has kept to herself these last years, refusing to talk to the media. But she's working on a book about the most wanted man in America and spoke with Court TV in interviews taped both in New York City and Florida. There is a million dollar reward and I would not like um, to have my face on TV. You never know what someone would attempt to do. 
holding me as a hostage, perhaps, to um, entice Eric out of the woods. She believes her son is innocent and that the government has targeted him because of her left-wing radical past. He lives in a family that were considered radical. We were pacifists and anarchists in our very early days, and they know that. They keep a list of everybody. Now she wants to publish and publicly defend her son. I was living with him at the time of the Olympics. In fact, we went to uh, an Olympic event in Tennessee where they did the kayaking. There was no indication that uh, he was planning anything. Uh, there was no discussion about the Olympics other than we enjoyed that event. When Eric Rudolph was born in South Florida, his father worked on the launch pad for NASA's Apollo project. And when Mother Patricia looks at pictures from those days, she sees an innocent young boy who was energetic and curious. He was very uh, inquisitive. Uh, he loved um, playing with the local children, taking walks. He was quite a walker even then. It was hard for me to stay up with him. Eric's around uh, 10 years old here. The coach was a brother of the coach at Miami University. And he felt that Eric had so much potential that he should go to Miami U. When Eric's father died of cancer in 1980, Patricia moved the family to their summer cabin in the Nantahala Forest of North Carolina. It was a different world than the one Eric grew up in as a child, but he took to the wilderness and learned to love the simple pleasures of rural life. Eric had a special fondness for the Nantahala Gorge and went fishing with our neighbor, an old timer, that showed him the little pools where the trout congregated. The Rudolphs lived a self-sufficient backwoods life, growing their own food and working on projects around the house. They stayed to themselves, but that was not so unusual in the Bible Belt Mountains. Eric got his GED and eventually went to Western Carolina University. He dropped out after a year and a half to join the Army. Well, he was disillusioned mostly by the fact that he wanted to be a trooper, and uh, he was put into the 101st which is a uh, repelling outfit. They jump out of helicopters. And he was not fond of that at all because he saw too much that occurred. Um, in fact, uh, three or four different accidents, one in which he was very close to the one group that was wiped out. From what I heard from the others, and I don't know how true it is, he was dismissed for smoking marijuana. Eric lived at the family home in the Nantahala Forest. He worked on carpentry projects around town with his brother Dan until they sold the family house. Eric then went west looking for a new home in the Rocky Mountains, according to his mom. He eventually came back to North Carolina and settled in Murphy, a small town down the road from his family home. The FBI has charted Eric Rudolph's travels, and one part of his youth that they've re-examined concerns a time when he was a teenager and his mother brought him to a so-called Christian identity church. I went there mainly for the schooling. We were having difficulty getting good schooling in Nantahala. Eric and, and Jamie both needed more stimulation. So I thought if I could expose them, to Christian education and do homeschooling. By some accounts, Eric Rudolph, for instance, was a, you know, a fairly nice young man, uh, kind of growing up in Florida and then the hills of Western North Carolina. Uh, the fact is, is that once he and his family uh, started to get involved in identity and in an identity church in Shell City, Missouri as well, he in particular became more and more violently uh, uh, opposed to those he saw as his enemies. The Church of Israel is run by Pastor Dan Gaiman, and he has strongly denied to Court TV that his church espoused anti-Semitic, anti-government, and racist theology associated with Christian identity. A 
According to some Nantahala locals, Eric Rudolph had expressed extremist views. In high school, he wrote a paper calling the Holocaust a hoax and voiced suspicions that the federal government was using social security numbers to spy on people. The Southern Poverty Law Center, a hate watchdog group, claims to have linked Eric Rudolph to a North Carolina militia group and to Christian identity leader Nord Davis Jr. Patricia Rudolph doesn't believe there's much truth to these rumors or to the federal government's charges. She says that Eric never expressed an opinion on abortion, enjoyed watching the Olympics, and just months before he disappeared, went to visit his gay brother and his companion in New York. Eric and I visited them two months before this bombing occurred. He was very amiable. We went to dinner together, saw a video, I believe, together. As the FBI pursued its investigation, the Rudolph family began to feel the pressure of the media spotlight. Hardest hit was Eric's brother, Dan. He set up a video camera in his workshop and proceeded to cut off his own left hand with a power saw. The Justice Department got the tape, but won't release it. I can't really comment on the, uh, on the, on, on the reason for that as well as the, uh, the incident itself. Uh, it was a very unfortunate event. We were not uh, uh, expecting that. We certainly would have taken steps to prevent it had we known that was going to happen. I just cried, screamed, cried, screamed, and cried all night, all day. They wouldn't allow me to see him. They had uh, police at his door in the hospital, and I could not visit him. Daniel was like a father substitute for Eric, and uh, this hit him very, very hard. While the FBI may have been sympathetic to Patricia Rudolph, they were hunting a cold-blooded killer who just might be her son. He was considered armed and dangerous and was to be taken alive if possible. Why would he be dangerous? I've never seen any arms on him or in his truck. I mean, this is a mother speaking about her son, and I had no indications of him being dangerous to anyone. I think that it's a conspiracy. I've always felt this way. I don't think these things happen accidentally. I think they pinpoint people, and he's one of them. Coming up on Mugshots, we follow the FBI's trail as they search for signs of an alleged anti-abortion underground called the Army of God. Could there be a secret group whose mission is to end abortion with deadly violence? Rudolph has vanished, and he has become an obsession by forces on both sides of the abortion civil war. To the defiant religious right, he is a foot soldier who has outmaneuvered the FBI and embarrassed the Clinton administration. To pro-choice activists, he is a nightmare who is still out there, somewhere, and just maybe ready to strike again. I am not going to give up hope that he'll ever be caught. I have to assume that he's not caught that he is still alive, that he can still do this to someone else. Give him a medal, key to the city, something like that. I don't think they should prosecute him. The nurse was an accessory to a murderer. She helped a murderer kill innocent people. The guards stood guard while they killed innocent people. So they were accomplices to murder. I believe that the place behind me is just an American death camp. Uh, they kill innocent people probably by the tens of thousands over the last 25 years since Roe v. Wade. So uh, if you ask how I feel about it, I feel like this place got what it deserved. Over the past decade, as the rhetoric from extreme anti-abortion leaders has embraced a holy war, the individual acts of murder by gun and by bomb have followed. People are out there encouraging the violence and encourage killing reproductive health care providers. And then you get somebody who hears that and they take it up as, as another hate. Hate leads to violence. Hey, don't mess with my side, buddy. Don't mess with my side. They see the pictures, and the picture it makes them angry. It's these type of people that stand around and protest, they make things worse than what they are. Well, why is it that we choose to play God then? It's because people like this, that's when you have these bombings, and you have this guy running around the country, and nobody knows who he, you know, he's number one on America's Most Wanted. 
Because of what? Because of these people. You are the people that, that drive people like that to do that shit. I abhor all evil. Yeah. Get in the car. Hey, Mr. Bell. Yeah. What is that? In the car. Shut up. That's what they do in there. They take the life of the children. Up, man, just shut up. Over 40,000 babies have died in this Don't abortion. Don't give me your stupid f***ing... 40,000 no, no, no. babies have died here. All right. No what? Like and, like and, and people, for your cause, blow up abortion. Abortion. Abortion protesters in Alabama sought to distance themselves from the bombing. It's obvious to me that, that the act was not really an abortion issue anyway, because a police officer was killed and, and an employee. Um, I mean, it's if someone had really wanted to do something, they would have done, done uh, destroyed the building or the doctor. You know, so it's pretty obvious that it really had nothing to do with abortion anyway. I think that Eric is, uh, has some problems. He's not pro-life. He wouldn't have uh, killed someone and caused a bomb to occur if uh, he didn't have uh, some problems. I think Eric uh, needs to know that uh, pro-life uh, stands for uh, life and the life of the babies and also life of uh, the workers or doctors or anybody else. FBI profilers working on the Eric Rudolph case are trying to determine if earlier acts of violence by anti-abortion activists influenced him. They're looking at the case of Paul Hill in Pensacola, Florida. Hill went from protester to gunman and assassinated an abortion doctor. That death touched off a fierce debate over the use of violence to stop abortion, and it was a group of priests and extremely religious followers that stood up for Hill's actions. If what Paul Hill did is violence, it would be the same as if a gunman went into the local elementary school, lined up the first graders, and was shooting them one by one, and Paul Hill came and shot that person and killed him. More will die, I believe, but this is a war, and we will be pushed aside very soon by people who are far more militant, including Muslims. Imagine the phrase pro-life Muslim state that after an atomic bomb. Imagine if even a couple of thousand Christians in this country decide to go the Paul Hill way. We'll have chaos. We'll have an ocean of blood. They must ban abortion now. The extremist rhetoric heard in Pensacola, Florida, seemed to confirm the fears of pro-choice activists that a so-called army of God had been formed to take violent action against abortion clinics. I feel that there is at least a nationwide conspiracy, if not an international conspiracy, that filters information and funds and bodies to the different locations. They target hot spots around the nation. This has been um, done for quite a few years. They can't seem to accept that each individual is acting on their own initiative out of belief and relationship with Almighty God. No faction of the anti-abortion movement has come forward to declare themselves members of the Army of God. To do so would make them immediate targets of the FBI. However, letters were sent in the name of the Army of God taking credit for the clinic attacks in Birmingham and Atlanta. The FBI also has a taped phone call from a man saying he's a member of the Army of God. Eric's brother, Jamie Rudolph, told Court TV in an off-camera interview that investigators wanted to know if the voice, even though it's disguised, is Eric Rudolph. He didn't think it sounded like his brother. Whether Eric made the call or not, the shadowy name of the so-called Army of God haunts this case. But what is the Army of God? Is it a deadly organized and secret group as the pro-choice people fear? Or is it a mythical creation, a catchphrase spouted by individuals united only in their thirst for violence against abortion clinics? Certainly fringe ministers and priests have tried to justify lethal force in a higher cause. Death is a message that people understand. Well, you don't know who is going to come out next to do something or who they will do it against. And uh, this has uh, made, been made clear by the folks advocating violence. Professor Dallas Blanchard believes there's a link between the murders which began in Florida and have escalated around the country. He studies the radical anti-abortion movement and predicted before Eric Rudolph's alleged attacks that there is more violence and death to come. Local officials, politicians, and police tend to think that Paul Hill is an aberration. He isn't. He's a normal outgrowth of what happens in social movements. 
And as social movements get more and more on the defensive, they tend to get more and more violent. And so all communities in the nation need to be, I think, alerted to that possibility that it could be them. Kill a few here and there, have it over more than one part of the country, and uh, the, the terror will spread. Paul Hill was convicted and awaits execution in Florida. The Birmingham bombing remains unsolved. And the search for Eric Rudolph continues. The mystery surrounding his disappearance has intensified, and the FBI struggles with the dark possibility that Eric Rudolph is being sheltered by the army of God and could be hiding anywhere. Coming up, the unthinkable for the FBI. Eyewitness accounts from people who believe Rudolph was not only sheltered, but has been given a helping hand to flee the mountains of North Carolina, despite the massive FBI dragnet. Time dragged on, and Rudolph continued to elude capture. The suspicious Bible Belt folks of the Smoky Mountains remained tight-lipped, and the terrain gave Eric Rudolph a home field advantage. For 30 months, he eluded the FBI, and to some, he even became a folk hero. I use it every day. Let's touch it. Okay. <laughs> it was given to me by the man who bought the house from Eric and his mom up in Nanhala. Well, the guy gave it to me, and I said, well, I'll just use it as a conversation piece. A lot of people are all for him. A lot of people are against him. Matter of fact, there were some people in here yesterday, two, two guys, younger guys from Ohio, and they said that they, they, would, they would shoot him. Live and direct from high atop Red Mountain, overlooking the beautiful city of Birmingham, Alabama, this is Back Talk 1070. I'm Richard Dixon. I spend most of my weekends up there. Uh, in the summertime, paddling whitewater. Mm. And judging by some of the locals that live there, I wouldn't doubt for a second that he's living with somebody up there. What happened was the group uh, took Rudolph, who was getting too high profile, oh, and I've they killed him one. and they buried him somewhere. Right? They uh -huh. stuck him under the cabin, you know? Yeah. That's one that gets thrown around a lot. I don't think he's there anymore. don't think he's been there since about six months after it happened. They catch everybody else. That's what would make me wonder why they can't catch him, you know? You know, if they're saying they're using that much manpower with all the technology they got now, you know, it's funny they hadn't rooted him out. The suspect, I believe, has a wonderful network of help in his community. They do not believe he's done anything wrong, therefore he shouldn't be turned in. So I think he's got all the support he needs in that area, and that indeed he may be in somebody's basement uh, receiving that help. and. You know, eating and showering every day just like everybody else. I doubt if he's in the wilderness now. He probably was at first, but somehow someone's befriended him. Well, he got to be helped. You know, that's, that was a major thing, you know. Because, you know, it, it was just like they missed him by 10 minutes that morning for him to get away. And, you know, they was hot on the trail. They hadn't found him yet. Everybody wondering why, really. I think he put in an appearance in North Carolina and then he's out west with one of the groups like Posse Comitatus or something like that that have went deep underground. In order to disappear, you've got to kind of have somebody who's helping you. And with the abortion issue, as polarized as it is, I just don't think it'd be too hard to find supporters for that. He could go really anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as he got out of the country, there are several countries that he could go to that would A, never know he's there, and B, if they did, wouldn't give him up. Shortly before Rudolph surfaced again during July 1998, many were speculating that he was dead or in Mexico or in Canada, but few were convinced that he was still in this area. He demonstrated then that this is where he feels comfortable, and we believe he still feels that way. Eric Robert Rudolph was a, was a paramilitarist, right? They never do anything without having an escape route planned. Uh -huh. they were, he had an escape route planned from day one. Mm -hmm. He got up there in North Carolina, was there for a short time. They used ham radio communications with the Montana groups to, to communicate a route of escape. Somebody has him so far under, you know, it may be decades before anything about him, you know, was ever brought to light. I don't believe for a second that Eric Robert Rudolph was not able to slip the net and is sitting down somewhere in the Bahamas or is over. I, you know who really springs to mind when I think about this, Dennis? Mm. 
Abby Hoffman. Abby Hoffman. Yep. Abby Hoffman lived a second life mm -hmm. for 20 years. Well, when you've got people that are sympathetic to your cause, it's not that difficult to do. Rudolph's ability to avoid capture has led many to believe that the Christian right now has its own underground. Does the Bureau believe that there's an anti-abortion or any government underground that could be helping? Uh, there's no indication that that uh, has occurred in this case. We don't uh, completely uh, uh, rule out that possibility, but right now we're looking for a single fugitive, and the search in response to your question extends uh, uh, beyond North Carolina. In June of 2000, despite the FBI's vow to capture Rudolph, they packed up their compound and moved out of Andrews. The local residents were glad to see them go. But the FBI could run a lower profile search indefinitely. They're keeping a dozen agents in the area to follow leads and hope that Eric Rudolph makes a mistake. The defiant t-shirts declared Rudolph the winner, but only for now. He can never rest easy because he will not know what we are doing to find him. Whether it happens while he's 32 years old or 62, we will be there. Coming up on Mugshots, a mother's tearful message to her son, the most wanted man in America. in Birmingham and Atlanta have left deep scars. As America's struggle with extremism moves on to the next battle, it has left many victims in its wake. It's been very hard on me and the whole family not to have Eric around because he is such a stimulating person and uh, not only my son but a good friend. If the person is ever caught, it will be a relief for me because I know at least that part of our life will be over. We'll move on to another section and then if he's ever convicted, that'll be another part of our life. It'll sh everything's just in steps. The decision of surrender or not is, um, is up to him. It has nothing to do with whether I want it or I don't want it. I think that if I get to see him, that will be all that I'll need. Uh, see him and ask, why, why did he do it? Was it for the abortion issue? Was it a government issue? You know, what was the purpose behind it? Because nobody at this point knows. He's in hiding. Nobody knows why he did it. To those who have been injured by this, you know, uh, family members are also upset and perhaps even seek revenge. Uh, that's between them and their God, and there's not much I can say or do to comfort them, uh, nor him. I am angry about what I've lost, my abilities that I've lost, my career that I've lost. All the aspects of my life that have changed, the hardest one is the vision. Because you go to bed at night, everything's dark, and you look and it's like, I do have two eyes because it looks all the same. Then when you get up in the morning, it's like, no, we're back down to one eye again. Patricia Rudolph cannot accept a life where her son has vanished into thin air. She desperately wants to see her son once again. She believes he's innocent and she's gone back to North Carolina to retrace the steps of the FBI. She's determined to find her son. And until she does, she has this advice for him. I would tell you, Eric, to trust in your heart. What your heart is telling you will not steer you wrong. Perhaps your mind is in overload, but find that solid, silent place within you and follow that, and you can't go wrong. <laughs>